Well, thank you for uh, spending the rest of your conference here with us at the main Chicago track. Um, we've heard all sorts of very interesting stories today about what has been accomplished by your trial, and we would be remiss if we didn't include United Airlines. Uh, and Joe is going. Joe Olson is going to introduce to us uh, what he has done to uh, improve uh, the customer experience of United Airlines um, using Apache Flight. So, Joe, thank you very much. All right, so this is actually my second talk. I lost a bet. I had it two talks. So this is, uh, I opened it yesterday and I'm going to close it today. So, uh, if you were at yesterday's talk, the first couple of slides here are going to uh, be a copy of what I did yesterday. I'm going to explain a little bit about United Airlines and, and how it's structured. So, the talk, um, we'll start out with United in the airline industry. Uh, now, the training model presents an opportunity. I will talk a little bit about Apache Flink. It can be used to address the opportunities that are presented by streaming, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Okay, so a little background about United Airlines. Uh, right now, we've got 1,340 aircraft, and that's uh, 779 mainline aircraft. Those are the single aisle aircraft that are. You can see over 100, 100 more people. And then 569 regional aircraft, which are the little ones that usually fly between here, like Indiana and Wisconsin, things like that. And there's 250 uh, additional aircraft on order right now. So, right there, the takeaway from all this is United has got a whole bunch of supply chain problems. You've got a manage, you've got a fleet of 1,300 aircraft, you've got all the uh, stock to dock, all the supply chain, all the predictive maintenance. All the, uh, any data problem you have with managing a fleet of 1,300 anything you're going to have. United Airlines moved 158 passengers last year. So uh, they've got a very uh, busy public facing website. Uh, they've got a, a mobile app that everyone uses. They use both of those things to sell uh, seats on the airline. So if you've ever bought a seat, you know that the seat's got a, uh, a time component to it. The closer to seat gets to departure, the more expensive the seat gets, that's for the supply and demand. Uh, it's got a geospatial component to it, so a seat in the front of the aircraft so it's more than a, a seat in the back of the aircraft. They also have a pretty complex loyalty program with that many people and the flying public with all the um, uh, all the frequent flyer programs out there, people want to be part of the loyalty program and earn status on the airline so they can get the benefits of status. So there's millions of people in that. You've got a loyalty program that has to do all the things you do in a loyalty program, which is surveys and uh, uh, analyzing uh, customer needs, things like that. And then in addition to that, you have ancillary sales, things like buying snack boxes, buying Wi-Fi, all that stuff, all the upsell stuff that uh, um, in your own notes. There's 4,900 daily departures for the airline. So all the scheduling problems, all the uh, uh, operations, all the weather, route planning, all those data problems uh, that are all associated with, with those things that airline has. There's 355 airports served in 48 countries. Uh, those are going 24-7. There's you know, baggage claim, check-ins all around the world. This is going on. That's all streaming data. Uh, all the event-driven stuff that you do when you go to an airport and you have to uh, maneuver through the airport to get to the gate and then actually get on the plane. And then there's 88,000 employees that all have to get scheduled and they have to get paid. So an airline is a very complex machine. It's always in, in motion. Uh, the future is always in flux. Uh, the reservation system is kicking out millions of messages a day of, of things that are changing. The place is really a data science stream. Every, every problem that there is out there, an airline has, every, every major uh, data problem, data science problem out there, it's some part of their airline hands. So if any of these problems appeal to you and you want to spend a career solving them, an airline might be a good, good place to start. So the business goals we have as an analytics team uh, obviously improve the customer experience. We want to be able to uh, reduce friction when interacting with the airline, reduce friction when going to an airport, Booking and reservation, all these things that everyone does, you want to use analytics to make that a better and uh, easier experience. The 
messaging across the different channels. If you deal with United in the airport, you deal with United at United.com, or you deal with United on the mobile app, all of these different channels. We want to be able to uh, give a consistent message across all, all those channels. In addition to the customer experience, we also want to improve the employee experience. Since we have 88,000 employees, and these are frontline people that are actually making the airline work, uh, part of the analytics experience is improving uh, the employee experience. So we spend a lot of time uh, trying to arm employees with better tools and better tactics to, uh, to do their jobs better. Uh, we can learn from past experiences what worked, what didn't work, and try to use those to make the uh, suggest changes to the, to the processes. Uh, revenue generation, that's another very big business goal. Uh, how do we increase revenue for the company? How do we stay competitive with other airlines in the industry? All those are a part of the analytics process. And then finally, improve operational reliability. How can you better prepare for uh, weather situations, uh, maintenance issues, uh, service interruptions, things like that? So here's some ideas that the airline industry has come up with. Uh, I just went around and, and, and snagged a bunch of these off uh, different websites. All airlines are service companies, so they're all trying to solve these problems. And different airlines have different needs and different, they're taking a different tack on these problems. So uh, everything from improving the mobile experience to having services set up and ready for you to go when you arrive on board or arrive at the aircraft or at the airport, all these things are uh, currently being looked at by different airlines in different capacities. Okay, so one we're going to talk about today is uh, driven the customer experience via social media. So United has a uh, social media team. It's staffed 24-7 on the clock. And its sole purpose is to, to reach out to people on social media and resolve issues. And I think any service company these days would have something of that nature. So. Social media represents a unique opportunity for any service company. And if you go to our people, social media team, these, these will, this is what they, they'll tell you. You know, be able to connect to a customer in a familiar environment. Everyone uses social media. Uh, instead of making a customer go to a, an airline-specific site, maybe you can interact, them, interact with them in a media that they're, they're familiar with. You can also use it to uh, manage the brand. You can tell that, you know, this is, this is what this airline is all about. This is what we're trying to do. This is how... We're trying to improve the, the experiences for customers. You can build community and advocacy. Obviously, that's uh, an important one. And then, uh, finally, direct issues to appropriate channels so they can be handled uh, expediently. And that's what we're going to talk about here. So that's the big question there is, can we use social media as a giant issue tracking database? That's what the goal here is. Uh, that's not what anyone will tell you, but I think that's deep down Abstractly, I think that's really what any service company needs to do is can you use social media as a place to track issues? So some of the obstacles in that are obviously who am I talking to? Uh, social media isn't geared with any any identifiers other than a, a social media tag. Can you somehow take a social media tag and connect that up with somebody in your customer uh, database and then enriched experience because now you know more about that customer. That's a very big obstacle. And we even have that obstacle at the airline outside of uh, social media. Just people logging into United.com uh, or buying a ticket on a, uh, a company account rather than their own and not hooking up, uh, linking their information that they are have with their, their profile with the airline with the ticket they, they just purchased. Is there an issue? If so, what is the issue? Somebody on on social media, are they, uh, do they have an issue with something? Are they trying to explain something? What are they actually trying to tell you? If it is an issue, what is the current state of the issue? Is this an ongoing dialogue this person's been having with, uh, with the airline? Maybe over the course of a couple of days, maybe it's over the course of a couple hours, maybe it's a shift change in the uh, contact center. What is the current state of the issue and how did it get there? And then finally, are there any recommendations on how to handle the issue? That's, uh, uh, a lot of the issues that customers have with the service company will fall into you know, a finite number of buckets. Is there a way to take the issue that's out there, drop it into one of these buckets, and then recommend other course of actions that have been successful in the past to deal with that issue? And then 
who's the best at, 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 this, at the company to, who's best equipped to handle the issue? Can you route this to the appropriate party to specialists that can, can deal with that? So all of these need to probably be overcome within a few seconds of receive, receiving a notification if you want to act on this, uh, this information and use it to, to better the customer experience. So if we go through each one of these, there's really a bunch of things we're doing here, uh, abstractly. Uh, we talked about identification. We have to be able to link this up with somebody and ex explain uh, what they are, who this person is, and what is what you've been what you've done to them in the past, what their what their current state with the company is. Uh, classification and prioritization. Maybe uh, some of these issues are more important than others, and you have to be tagged as high priority to move to the, to the top of the queue. Uh, state determination. Again, what is the current state of the issue? How did it get there? Uh, this has all got to be uh, part of the process. Recommendation and clustering. Obviously, are there any recommendations? How do you make a recommendation on what to do in this situation? How do you cluster this with other situations that have occurred and reach into that bucket to say these are the, the proper steps to take in this situation? And then again, routing. Who's best equipped to handle this issue? So if you look at this, there's basically what we have to do is there's several enrichments we have to do, and we have to track state. If we can solve those problems with low latency, we will probably be able to improve the customer experience. And then obviously all this has to be uh, fault tolerance, high availability, and elastic. If there's uh, a weather situation, something that goes wrong that affects the system as a whole, we need to be able to, to, to elastically scale up so that uh, you can meet demand. So one of the tools out there, one of the frameworks out there that's, that's perfect for solving this type of problem is uh, Apache Flight. Uh, stateful compu uh, computations over data streams. So it's an event-driven uh, application and the architecture, in most of these diagrams I just ripped right off the uh, Apache web, or the uh, Flink website. Uh, this is a stateful streaming tool. So what this does is it processes messages coming in, you can act on them, and you can route them, you can uh, store them, you can do whatever you want with them. And since we talked about the requirements of this, obviously enrichment is one of the more important ones, so we have to figure out how we're going to use this framework to do enrichment. There's a few options for that. Uh, I put two of them on here. Uh, option one, one is enrichment, which you have to go outside the framework to get data and pull it into it. Uh, the second would be you process data coming in as a second string. So we'll go over each one of these and I'll just explain a little bit about how the, the framework would actually uh, overcome these problems with low latency and, and reliability. So option number one is, is very straightforward. You have uh, social media messages coming in from a source. You turn that into a key stream and the key would generally be by the um, identifier that the individual has. Um, you send that to a map function, and you hit some external store, and you do a lookup and you pull the stuff back. The problem with this is this is a synchronous process, and if the database is slow, if the network is slow, if the lookup process is slow, that's going to slow down the pipeline. Now, generally speaking, we don't have millions, you know, tens of millions of social media requests a day. It's much, much lower, so this really isn't a, uh, an issue in this case. But we'll talk about uh, the asynchronous solution. Uh, just to go through this and explain that the framework has a solution to handle this for high frequency uh, situations. So, uh, they get, Flink has got an asynchronous function and it's been in the data stream API since uh, for, a few, for a few years now, back in version uh, Flink 1.2. Right now, I think the latest release is 1.8. Uh, basically, that's implemented as a queue of promises. So, it's a general asynchronous model, I'm going to send data to this thing and I'm not going to wait for it, I'm going to keep on processing, and at some point, uh, that data is going to return to me and I'll process it once I get it. The problem with that is the client needs to be able to support asynchronous requests. So uh, a lot of cases, a lot of times what we have to do is we have to massage the, uh, the remote data source so that it acts in an asynchronous manner. So here would be an example of that, uh, data stream coming in, 
what this is, is this would be something like, or you have a string and we need to classify it. So a string, string type of situation. I got a string and I'm not classifying. The function in Flink to do this is actually has a couple of different variables. Uh, obviously, timeout. Uh, if the timeout, if the, if the service doesn't respond in that timeout, it's considered a failure, not a handle the failure situation. Uh, you've got a number of a capacity of how many of these remote requests you want queued up uh, before you have to start putting back pressure on the system. So if the database goes down and you've got a thousand requests queued up. Uh, maybe you want to slow down the pipeline until the database recovers or the external service recovers. Maybe you don't. Maybe you just want to keep on pushing things through as unclassified. You have uh, two ordering variables in this. You can say, whatever order I send things to get uh, classified, I want them back in the same order I got them, or send them back as soon as they were, they're classified. In the case of social media, generally, Order isn't important. I'm going to send a bunch of text to get classified when it comes back. I'll, uh, I'll deal with it when it comes back. In the event of uh, capacity exceeded, what will happen is the stream processor will just put back pressure on it and it'll slow the pipeline down. Okay, option number two is actually joining streams. This is kind of slow. Um, picture I've got a situation where uh, a bunch of customers are experiencing something and something in the system fails. And so what I need to know is I need to know um, what the current state of the system is. So maybe in an airline it's a situation where I've got the entire flight schedule in another queue and I've got all the, the people coming in uh, on one social media channel. What the stream processing engine allows you to do is it actually combine those, those streams. So if a customer says, hey, uh, I need to be rebooked, and we can easily link that customer's up, customer's uh, social media handle up to a reservation and pull out what their current reservation is, and we can join to the event stream on a, uh, on a flight, get the status of his current flight, and then find out what optional flights are. So that can all be done via uh, joining the stream. So we give you a couple different options for joining the uh, streams. Uh, one of the options is a window join, which is basically if you work with any streaming frameworks, one of the uh, elements in a stream framework is this concept of windowing. You can have well defined windows that events fall into, you can have uh, windows that move over time, uh, you can have windows that are defined as a session. So, joining streams in Flank, that first option is to join elements within a window. So maybe a window is a day, maybe a window is an hour, maybe a window is uh, whatever interval you define. That's one option to solve uh, how to join these streams. Another option is interval join. And that's basically you get, you still have to join on timestamps in this case. In this case, you can define the interval on the event time. The event time is extremely important in a streaming framework. That's when the event actually occurred. And you can say, okay, I want to be able to join up events on either side of the boundary. So I'll put uh, plus or minus a few minutes on this event, and I can join other events that occurred in that same window. Okay, so the other thing we're going to have to do to solve this problem, uh, those are the two enrichment options. This is the state management option. So again, Flink is a stateful uh, stateful streaming platform, so they give you plenty of uh, tools to, to manage state and turn. When I say state, what that means is, suppose I have a social media um, entry, I, 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 let's say I tweeted it at somebody, I tweeted it at a company, and then a few hours later I tweet that back. Those will be considered, the first tweet will be considered part of the states, the interaction I'm having with that, that customer. Now, that's a gross oversimplification of the problem because when you define where the state boundary is on that, uh, what, what constitutes this tweet is a part of a chain, all that other, all, of, all those, those, those edge situations. But what we'll talk about here is how that actually gets stored in the streaming platform. Normally, what you would do is the first option would be okay, I'll just write, I got a streaming platform, I'll just write stuff to a database, and I'll just interact with that database in a client server type. Uh, fashion. The problem with that is that's not fault tolerant and that doesn't scale. And that's what we've been doing for 
long before the SQL streaming frameworks came out. What Flink brought to the table was, what I'll do is in my stream processor, I will have local storage and I will store state in, and I'll make that call power. So what happens is, when a message comes in, it gets turned into a key, key stream. So all the keys go through the same processor, and hence the same local storage. So the picture on the right basically says, I'll have three processors, uh, each one of those processors will have its own state store. Each uh, element in the stream will get mapped to one of those three processors, and when I need to uh, look up state in those processors, I know right where to go to. The way the state works in Flink is basically key value call. So there are several back ends that you can put out of Flink to do this key value call. Uh, the lowest impact is obviously RAM. That's uh, for very small states, and what that allow you to do the lowest latency, uh, lowest state ability to store state, but that will be stored in RAM on the, on the different executors. So it's merely a function of how much RAM you have on each one of these, those three executors I had in the last, last picture. The second option is you actually store a file on the disk. A little more latent, but you've got more uh, ability to uh, store state. And then finally, they've got a, another uh, backend, which is RocksDB, which is a database designed for key, rapid key value calls for uh, low latency situations. And the types of state you can actually store, uh, the simplest is you store value. So, I've got a Twitter handle, and maybe I'm interested in simply when the last time I, I dealt with an issue. So that would, the, the value of that state would simply be timestamp. Uh, the key would, you put the key in, and it would return timestamp. The other uh, state operators, one is a list state. I can just uh, keep tacking new state on at the end of the old, old state. So uh, every message I have on my key, I just tack on the end of the list. So when I do my key value call, it returns a list. Uh, reducing state, that's just an aggregation. Um, yeah, a lot of times that gets used for like a poor man's windowing function. What I can do is I can compute an average, I can compute uh, some kind of aggregate function over time based on messages coming in. Aggregating state takes that to the next level. Uh, depending on the types of inputs I put in, I can change the aggregate function. And then finally, map state. That is uh, the most flexible. You put in a key on the states and you get a value back. So it's a key value store within the key value store. The good thing about that is you can also iterate over that so you can go through and see what's, uh, what the current state is. I can iterate over that and say uh, all these, these map functions, this is the current situation. Uh, okay, queryable state. This is the ability to pull state current state outside of the, the Flink environment. So what I can do is um, all this history we're building up, I'm going through a social media and I'm interacting with somebody and I'm building up uh, a long conversation with them to resolve this issue. That has the ability to get pulled outside of Flink and get API call. So in this case, what I could do is I could put in their uh, customer number, or I could put in their uh, social media handle, make the API call and get the uh, value of that state outside of uh, outside of the Flink platform. So the state store obviously is very important. You have to somehow protect it from uh, a disaster and any kind of fault tolerant uh, anything that uh, any other thing that can go wrong. So the the construct they give you inside Flink to do that is state one. And basically, that's an asynchronous write of the store to a shared file system. So I have the ability to take the state and preserve it outside of the, uh, the job manager, the executor, uh, the task manager for Flink. And at some point, if that job crashes, if that uh, task manager crashes, I can bring up a new one and sync the state off of the shared file system uh, back in and have another node going in. Now, obviously, the more frequently you sync state and the more the bigger your state is, the more overhead it's going to take to keep that sync. Uh, the last couple of releases of Flink, they've given you the ability to snapshot state to say, when, the first, when this first feature was first introduced, you had to write the whole state to the, the shared store. As the uh, product matured, 
they have the ability to only uh, sync what's changed to the store, and that improves performance dramatically. Okay, elasticity, as we mentioned, that's another, that'd be another function of what this, this, this uh, platform need, would need to do. Uh, again, that's for situations where, holiday situations where you've got a bunch of travelers or adverse weather situations um, or something else that goes wrong. Right now, this is in development in the, in the framework. Uh, it's called uh, active reactive. So, under one scenario, the active scenario, the Flink cluster itself allocates resources based on what it needs. The reactive is Flink is completely oblivious to the environments, you know, the Kubernetes environment, where Kubernetes controls, I'm going to throw more uh, task managers out there because I see back pressure building up and we need more uh, throughput through. So, we're going to uh, add that. Flink doesn't know. Is oblivious to the uh, to the manager there. The Jira for this is Flip Six. I've been following this one pretty closely to see how this goes through. Uh, and I think this is going to be one of the the, the next uh, big problems that this framework solves. If I can have streaming automatically scale up and down, and elasticity, as, as Morris said, is one of the uh, the emerging frontiers here. I think that will definitely make this, this framework a lot more uh, robust. It's a dream. All right. The uh, uh, the presentation on this was in San Francisco, 2019. Till Warren and David, one of the NRS together, the Verification Nation guys, gave it. Uh, and that was the, the state of what this, this feature is in. And I, I agree, it's going to be an uphill battle, but I think it needs to be, needs to be far. Okay, so back to our original problem. So we've got a way uh, to enrich the stream. We've got a couple different options to enrich the stream. We've got a couple, uh, one good way to uh, save state. So the other thing we need to look at here is a whole bunch of these enrichment processes are actually machine learning model tech applications. So the question becomes how to switch model versions without interrupting the stream. So I took Horace's and Dean's talk and put it down into one slide, which is how you do that in, in Flow. Uh, we don't have this working right now. This is on the roadmap, but we, in order to change models, we do have to start and stop the stream. But this is the uh, uh, the target environment. Uh, if you heard Boris's talk, he talked about this idea of a control screen. The way you actually implement that in Flink is you do what's called a connect join, and then you do a connect flat map. And what connect flat map will expose state to both of the streams simultaneously. So what you can do is you can, in a list state, you can say, hey, what's the current version of the model? What again in a list, the last uh, version of the model, and actually use that to make a call to the different models. Yeah, that slide is going. Okay, so this is the uh, Apache Flink. It's definitely a framework uh, worth following if you're in the streaming type use cases. Uh, there's plenty of ways to get involved, and there's plenty of new features to monitor. So thanks for the time. Yes. Two questions. Sure. First one. Uh, how much of the data that you mentioned would be useful to be pre aggregate? Like, you already know who's going to be flying when, what planes are going, all that. Good question. It sounds like a lot of it you can actually have ready to go uh, in case you need it. So, I think at this point, the number of uh, people that are actually reaching out to the company over social media is small enough where we do the workers. I think as time goes on and more and more people become interested in social media, well, become more comfortable communicating with uh, service companies over social media than over, you know, the going to the help desk or going to the 1 800 number or anything like that, going to the app. I think that number will go up. And again, since we're trying to use social media as a uh, issue tracking database. Social media is free. So we got a, a, a huge incentive to figure out how to steer people to use this to resolve issues. Uh, and I think as time goes on, it'll become more and more. Um, oh, I remember that. 
I don't know where that blank slide was supposed to be. It was supposed to be bootstrapping state. So the question becomes now, how do you bootstrap state into this? Uh, this would be a situation where, um, how do you get data into this thing that either has a low probability of being used or uh, you don't think you're going to use it, something like that. The second question is, do you have a sense of the size of Data, megabytes, records, whatever you like. It's low gigabytes, very low gigabytes at this point. Again, it's not, this isn't uh, something that everybody is doing. It's in the low gigabytes. It's handleable by a small cluster at this point. Using conventional tactics. So I guess if I tweet on, if I tweet about the United Planet and put it by confirmation, so now I'm locked. <laughs> so, so the question is now how, okay, so if we're going to use social media as an issue tracking database, how do we make it more efficient? Maybe my how do, is, uh, <laughs> educate, educate the public on what the, what the, how to tweet to a service company so that we've got a higher probability of getting a response and a reason why. Yeah, that's that definitely gets bucketed. Uh, that helps with the prioritization. You know, if you've got a um, a situation that's um, my flight is going to be my flight four hours from now is going to be delayed versus my flight right now is delayed. You want to be able to, to prioritize that sooner rather than, than later. Uh, situation: I left something on an aircraft. Maybe that gets bumped to the top of the queue because you need to react on that more quickly. So the prioritization is evolving. And it's uh, getting better. Are you able to say the challenges of that for some like Oh yeah, there's a lot of that, and that needs to be. That's another part of the prioritization is how to filter out uh, legitimate requests from you know the trolls. That's that's uh, that's important too. Okay, well, thanks for. I, I just have one uh, one kind of tangential question sure. uh, on other things that you mentioned. Uh, but I'm just curious. Uh, so you're talking about, I think everybody in the room can picture the sort of things you're using big data for in terms of engine performance, in terms of uh, uh, you know, uh, fuel, fuel burn, and all Absolutely. sorts of other. I mean, that's simple. Um, so, but I have a, one of my friends uh, uh, down. Um, so is this actually? So are you actually using the, some of those big data uh, solutions in terms of actually trying to anticipate, predict, and change the outcomes just in terms of the random yeah, off? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh, just like, like I said in the first slide, it's every data science problem we've got. Somebody at the airline is working on whether or not they're going to be able to scale out. Whether or not they're going to. Uh, uh, be able to affect, turn what they're doing into something that actually affects operations with the airlines is another story. But everyone is exactly working on these things. And the, the, the amount of tools that the team was talking about, how to productionize uh, it. We've got that problem in time is unlimited because everyone in the company has got their own little part that they understand and are using R, Python, uh, off the shelf products, uh, SaaS, you name it. Uh, to, to solve their problem, somebody has to come along. You know, part of my team has to come along to figure out how to operationalize that. Uh, the maintenance is a big area. Predictive maintenance IoT. Uh, that's probably uh, the biggest. The, world's area. the customer stuff has been around. The, the, the stuff we're talking about right now has been around for a while. The maintenance stuff seems to be where the high growth is right now. Uh, I think that will get higher growth. When the cost of offloading air data from an aircraft to the ground in real time falls, because right now it's too expensive to do a lot of this stuff uh, in real time. So when the plane lands and pulls into a station, it automatically connects to the Wi-Fi in the you know the the, the magazines and gigs of blogs have built up uh, since last time it hit a Wi-Fi station. All get offloaded, and I think it's it's when you know the price of offloading data from an aircraft, the reliability of the price drop. Significantly, then we'll start doing the more real time stuff. So, you guys building 
Uh, I guess me personally, if I do. No, I'm not the plane that's buying something like this. Oh, the airplane. Uh, they've got all sorts of different channels, and a lot of those uh, go through different other, not the public Wi Fi channel. And that is evolving. And it's, that is, you know, United will say that's an industry problem, and that's true. Uh, think about this you're moving in at 500 miles an hour through the air. How, you know, Everyone expects Wi-Fi to work the same way it works here, right? But think of all the weather, think of all the uh, latency issues, think of all the, uh, uh, the complexity of actually solving that problem. It's actually quite a complex problem. And you're also locked out of the region. It works better in some areas than that. We've done studies on it to see which part of the, you know, the domestic routes, where the, the strong points are and where the weak points are. And again, United mostly buys that service from other third service providers. It's not the airline that, that runs those things. It's the you know, Panasonic, the GoGo's, the, Go the, uh, those guys of the world actually are the ones that uh, United purchases that service from. Sorry? Do you use PMML? Um, we use PMML, we use Pickle, we use Onyx, we use uh, Sweat and Elbow Grease, everything. Uh, Everything you, everything that's out there, somebody at that airline is working on it, and they throw it over the wall and say, "Can you help me productionize this?" So it's uh, everything. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now I have an update. A very last minute that based on uh, weather coming in and so forth, the speaker's reception has been moved to right here. So, 